this started now. What's up, everybody? I'm Chris Daly from the Sports Court, joined here by Dallin Stanford from the Rugby Corner and a professional or a former professional rugby player and now turned announcer. So, Dallin, thanks for coming on. It's, you know, it's going to be a pleasure talking to you. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. Really cool with what you're doing and excited to be here. Thank you. So, um, you know, so you grew up in South Africa and now you live in here in America. But uh, growing up in South Africa, how were you introduced to the game? Yeah, so South Africa, um, there, there are a couple big sports. Uh, soccer is very big there. Rugby is massive. Uh, cricket is another large one as well. But, but rugby, I would say, uh, in my family and uh, my community, rugby was the biggest sport. And as a young baby, uh, my, one of my first gifts from my grandparents was a rugby ball. And so from a young age, I've been throwing the ball around. And then as soon as I could uh, walk or run, I started tackling people. And so I would say rugby started at that age and, uh, and continues till, till now. Now I still play um, touch rugby and things like that, you know. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, that obviously turned out to be pretty successful because you go to the University of Cape Town, which, you know, is the biggest city over in South Africa, one of them. So uh, what did it mean for you to go to Cape Town and represent the Tigers? Yeah, that was a really... Uh, unique and wonderful experience um the there were so many brilliant players that went before me i uh, looked up to uh, from that region that represented the university of cape town side and uh, newlands is a big rugby ground uh, and it's where a few games for the rugby world cup in 1995 were south africa hosted and so i got to see them play there so to be able to you know uh, get older and, and and make that uct side was just a, a wonderful experience um and and, and, uh, and such an honor because players came from all around the country and um, the big rivalry with UCT is Stellenbosch University. And Stellenbosch are, are renowned for producing the, uh, some of the most spring box uh, that, uh, through the years. And so we had a great rivalry with them. So it was, uh, it was fantastic just to wear the, uh, the UCT stripes. And, I mean, with Cape Town, you win, you know, you go undefeated, uh, you win a championship and all. So, like, describe that in 2000. So, I mean, like, really describe that unprecedented amount of success you guys had that year. Yeah, so... so that was a unique season. Um, so I mentioned Stellenbosch, and, and to beat Stellenbosch was uh, was uh, uh, was rarely ever done by any side, at, at any level. And so uh, because they drew from the big Afrikaans schools uh, uh, called Paul Rose, Paul Jim, Bolalampo, all those schools. And so when we were high school, we'd play those individual schools, and, and it would be a battle, it'd be a real struggle. So for them collectively to go to Stellenbosch and us, uh, Ronnebosch, Bishop, Sachs, Weinbergs, our Southern Suburbs schools to go to UCT, uh, we knew it was going to be tough, but. That, that season in 2000, uh, we had some remarkable players. One of them, um, Brent Russell, went on to become a Springbok uh, later later that year. And so we, 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 were, we were very fortunate. So to be able to beat Stellenbosch uh, home and away um, and go through unbeaten was was amazing. And at the time, you know, you, you're playing rugby, you're having fun, um, you're having a good time off the field because you're at university. You don't realize that, um, you know, this was something as unique as it was. And so we actually have a 20-year reunion coming up if we win it safe to travel yeah. to, for that group to meet up for the very first time since since that year. So you know, very special moments and things you look back on and you realize, wow, um, you know, that was, a, uh, that was a dream to be a part of. Right. Well, I mean, I'm hoping you get that opportunity to do that. So uh, you mentioned, like, you know, your grandparents giving you the rugby ball, for, you know, from the time you are pretty much, you know, a baby. And so, like, for American viewers who may not understand, like, kind of describe the impact rugby has on the society over there in South Africa. Yes, very good question. Um, so, so, so first, I'm a massive fan of sports in general because I think it's a it's it's one of the ways you can connect with people from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. South Africa had some terrible political issues going on when I was growing up, and sport was a way where you could be equal with everybody. And I'll never forget watching uh, South Africa host the 1995 Rugby World Cup. And I went to the opening game. I was 16 years old. Uh, I was in high school. Went with three or four friends. And we watched South Africa beat Australia in the opening game. And afterwards, everybody flooded the streets. It doesn't matter where you were from, uh, 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 all walks of life, all South Africans connecting over that victory and, and pride in, in, in South Africa. And uh, so that's kind of the unique thing, I think, that sport has the power to change people's minds, has a people, uh, sport, uh, as Nelson Mandela used during that era, um, it, it, was, it was really a way to unite a nation. And there has been a movie made about it called Invictus, uh, directed by Morgan Freeman. Yeah, I've heard of that. And yeah. it, 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 you've heard it. You need to watch it. it it's something very special because the the it's it, it's tough in a um, uh, a modern day society, uh, you know, to to recreate that. 
And, uh, and that moment in time was very special. And to this day, sport does does that, whether it be rugby or any other sport, it does really bring people together. Um, and that's brilliant for, for society. Yeah, and I mean, like, I was actually, you know, in school, I had to write something about that, about COVID-19 and, like, the impact it's had. And I actually wrote about just what you said, pretty much, about sports, how it usually can impact us. But, you know, unfortunately, in this time, it can't. So, um, I mean, like, overall, though, like, how was your collegiate career at Cape Town? I had a great time. I think I was very blessed uh, at that time to, uh, to to be able to focus on sports, but at the same time focus on my studies. I studied marketing and advertising. Uh, my father was a very, a very keen proponent of uh, one's education. And, uh, and in South Africa, which I think is fairly different here to the U.S., um, most people have the opportunity to go to university um, in South Africa and, and get a higher education, which is so important because you want to be happy in the rest of your life with what you what work you end up doing and what sort of passions uh, you end up following. And so I think that was very unique. And, and coincidentally, I have used that marketing and advertising background uh, in, later in life, which was fantastic because because you can't rely on, on sport to, to, to take you for your whole journey because at some point you're going to have to retire. Yeah, so I mean... At Cape Town, like, you know, just an honest question, like, what was your most memorable memory? Because you mentioned a few, like, with your time at Cape Town. I will say um, on the field, the most memorable times, uh, if I look back, just being in South Africa and being in Cape Town, um, I went to a high school called Ronnebosch Boys High School, and we played against Bishops, our big rivals. And I suppose the rivalry matches are, because they have so much history in them and, and there's so much riding on the game, you do remember those uh, matches. I, I don't remember many other matches stand out, but uh, playing against Bishops, I was always very special um, at home and away, and we were fortunate to have a good a good season and, and, and beat them both times. And the same would, uh, would be said for Stellenbosch. Um, at my under-20 level, we managed to beat them, but at first-team level, they were very elusive. But one time we were able to play them, we tied eight all um, in Stellenbosch, and then the return fixture, we beat Stellenbosch. Um, by, by about 10 points. So that was that was unique and that was amazing. But I will say the, the best memories were probably off the field. Um, uh, just so many great people and characters um, and having a few drinks and having a few laughs and uh, just so many brilliant memories uh, uh, of that. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, one of them, I was chatting to a friend the other day on a dare. Um, we were uh, at the rugby club and after the games and the Springbok coach at the time is Nick Mallett. He's a huge guy, six foot four. He's massive. He's at, at, at an event there. And one of my rugby friends dares me to tackle him. And so I did. I ran across. And when you're young, when you're 20 years old and a crazy student, things happen, you know. So yeah. we still laugh about that about that moment <laughs> these days, the, the mis mischief you get up to off the field. That's crazy. So, I mean, after your time in college, you do a move that might be even crazier by going to the United States. Uh, first off, I mean, was there anything in between that time? And secondly, why did you make the decision to come here to the States? Yes, so the, the so after I finished high school, I went out and spent a year in England, um, and I stayed at a, a, a high school. I was a, like lived in a boarding house. I coached sports, and I was like a housemaster there. So I kind of did a gap year between then studying at university. And after university, I thought, I'll do the same thing. I'll go somewhere else. And I've never been to, to the U.S. So I came to America in 2003 and found a rugby club in, in Southern California and played a, a, a 15 a side season and a seven season with them and had a brilliant time. And my plan actually was to go home back to South Africa and, and that was it. But um, I, I had such a good time here that the rugby club were able to get me a visa to bring me back the following year. And in that time period, I met my, my wife to be. Um, and we've been married now for almost 15 years. So uh, life has, a, has an amazing way to work out. If it wasn't for rugby, I wouldn't, wouldn't be here. Yeah, I mean, like, off the field of, you know, from rugby, like, how was your transition to the States, you know, the whole different lifestyle? Yes, that's another good question. Um, so many differences, uh, even in just the way, uh, you know, certain things are described, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the language, the language, even though it's English, uh, you know, there's some things that, you know, uh, we would call things different things. So I would say the transition was... Uh, was easier because I, I made friends with a, a lot of people at the rugby club, and so they were able to help me out. Um, you know, give me a place to stay. Uh, someone kindly donated their old car so I could drive around. Those kind of things really helped my my transition and uh, and kind of adapting to to a different way of life. Um, and and uh, I suppose even though I am an American citizen and uh, I still have my South African roots and South African accent, so I'm kind of proud of to be both South African and American at the same time and a bit, a bit of blend of both cultures. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned, you know, being a bit of both, you actually, you know, represented the U.S. Uh, rugby team on, you know, the international level. So, like, what were you, like, thinking as you got that call to become, you know, a, a U.S. Eagle? 
Well, to be honest, when I first got the call, uh, it was it was after we had a, um, a national championship sevens tournament, and the U.S. Eagle coach was selecting his squad to try out to to make uh, to play on the World Series. And when he called me, I said, thank you very much. That's a great honor, but I would have to decline because I'm South African. And he said, listen, we said, well, hold on. He said, you, you haven't played for South Africa. I said, no, I haven't. He goes, and you've been in America now for three years. And so you are eligible to play for, for, for the U.S. Um, because I was becoming a citizen. So I didn't even know that it existed or one could do that. Um, and so once I went to tryouts, I, I had a great time there uh, and really enjoyed my rugby. I got a chance to play on the Sevens World Series. And I will say uh, my debut was in 2007 in Wellington in New Zealand, running out there wearing an American jersey, um, playing against South Africa. It was a surreal, a weird, strange, but an amazing, amazing moment, of course, amazing feeling. Because as a youngster growing up in South Africa, all you wanted to do was represent your country in rugby. And so to be able to do that for my adopted country was was very special. And to play against South Africa was, was amazing as well. A couple of guys tackled me a bit harder because I knew I was from, from South Africa. I mean, that's surreal, though. You know, like, you know, the world coming full circle, they say. I mean, that just shows it. So, um, you know, you're part of the rugby 2009 7s Rugby World Cup that, and, you know, that took place in Dubai. What was it like to be part of that squad that participated in the most, you know, known rugby, you know, tournament in the whole world? Yeah, it, it definitely was something uh, like a year or two out that you would start to think about, I need to prepare for this, and, and the goal was to play in that World Cup. Um, and I think as a youngster, so so of course you want to represent your country or adopted country, and then you want to play in a World Cup, or at least go to a World Cup, uh, you know, in any capacity. And so um, the fact that I got an opportunity to do that was amazing, and, um, you know, kind of we still to this day share those memories with the squad members that were there. Um, on the field, the results didn't go as according according to plan, but that happens, right? Um, you, you forget those, but you really remember you're traveling around in the desert on camels, unique environments, uh, something that is, you know, really a weird mix of deserts and the tallest building in the world. All those kind of things uh, things come to mind, you know. So I, I got an opportunity you know, later as well to go to the World Cup last year, uh, the 15th World Cup in Japan, and this time as a commentator. So it was really unique and, and a different experience to be on the other side of it. Uh, to be able to work in the broadcasting, very, very special. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, now there's Major League Rugby, but there wasn't, you know, these widely regarded professional leagues back then when you were playing club. So kind of what was what was your club experience like in America? Yeah, Chris, you've done your research really well. <laughs> um, there, there, there weren't many outlets, you're right. So I played um, club rugby with a team called Occidental uh, Old Boys here in, in Los Angeles. And I uh, had, a, had a really, really fun 15 season with them, but they weren't that competitive when it comes to, uh, you know, the top teams in the country. So eventually I moved to a team in Long Beach, uh, California, called Belmont Shore. And we had a very good team and a great squad, and the level was excellent. And um, we were able to win a national championship in 2007 with them, so that was fantastic. And then on the seven, seven side of things, um, Occidental, uh, Old Boys, and Belmont Shore, we combined a team. And in the end, we played it... Um, our very first nationals in 2006, and we ended up then going on to uh, become champions in uh, 2009, I think it was. We lost in 2008 and 2010, but it was amazing to be able to compete with the best players in the country um, and get access to that. And to this day, I say, I tell people, I wouldn't have been seen and uh, by the U.S. Uh, national selectors or played on the Sevens World Series if I didn't play for a strong seven-a-side team that made that national tournament. Um, you know, so they, they really uh, put us on the map. Yeah, I mean, I have a question, like the national tournament, were there teams like, you know, all around the country or was it kind of just California based? Like, what was it? Yeah, no, good question. Again, it was all over the country. How it works is every year the top 16 teams in the country have to qualify um, and there are a certain amount of teams from each region. So California, I think we had allowed two, two teams. Um, so it was us and a team from uh, San Diego who had won many years called uh, OMBAC, Old Mission Beach. And so they were fantastic. And the weird thing is, we were in California. We didn't know about this national tournament. We would play this team on back in every single final um, in all these different tournaments. And we would lose by maybe one try. And so we were, you know, disappointed. We lost to them. We didn't know that this team was ranked number one in the country. So when we, went, we played at nationals, we would beat a lot of the sides because we were used to that top level. So they really helped prepare us for the national stage. Oh, yeah, and that's, that's amazing. So, I mean, like... But throughout all of this, you know, when was it really crossing your mind that maybe it was time to step away from the game as a player? Yeah, so the, the time period when I played for the U.S., we still had to have day jobs. So everybody had to work and, and provide for your family in that way. Um, we were paid a small stipend to represent the U.S., a daily stipend. Um, and that was only if you made the team and then traveled, you know, on, on the Sevens World Series. And so I was, um, I had my marketing and advertising background. So I always knew I wanted to be in that or, or media. 
and the opportunity arose um, uh, while I was playing on the Sevens World Series to get involved in a media role shortly after I retired. So in 2009, after that Sevens World Cup in Dubai, I retired and then straight away became the media manager for the US team. I got a chance to go to uh, World Cup in New Zealand uh, in 2011 and the Sevens World Cup in Russia in 2013. And, uh, and, and since then, I've kind of been involved in rugby, you know, over the years in different yeah. capacities. Yeah. been for you as, you know, a person. Yeah, so it, 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 the great thing was uh, my parents were always proponents of uh, enhancing your education and providing opportunities that way. And the, the, the funny thing is my dad did say to me once, and he said, you know, you can't be a professional sports person for, for the rest of your life. But the funny thing is that I have been involved in sports and rugby for my whole life, and that is unique. My father's era growing up, there were set jobs one could do. And there weren't many things to, to be involved with, with with rugby per se. So since retiring, I've been involved with coaching. I've coached a few different teams and had great fun, especially on the seven-a-side field. Uh, I've done the media roles that I mentioned. Um, and then uh, uh, working with young kids using rugby as a vehicle for social change. That was probably the most powerful job that I've worked on here in Los Angeles for about seven years with Play Rugby USA. And then getting into commentating, broadcasting, has really been a unique and wonderful a dream come true to be able to you know, commentate and share the excitement of the game to people around the world. Um, and so that's kind of where I am in now. And and then I'm also, like you, you're doing a brilliant podcast. I'm kicking off a podcast soon called The Rugby Hive, um, where I talk to um, ex-international rugby players and coaches. Um, and so uh, it, it, it's amazing. So, I mean, like as the announcer now, you did commentate the Rugby World Cup this past year. So, uh, I mean, I was reading about it. You know, you get the email, you think it's a scam and like, What's going through your mind as you get that email like, hey, you know, you're selected, one of four people? Yeah, so I, again, like I didn't know this. I was in, I, just the email was from World Rugby saying you're you're in the commentating pool for selection for the Rugby World Cup 2019. So I thought, oh, that's great. What an unbelievable honor. There must be 50 or 60 broadcasters who are in the pool. That's fantastic. Brilliant. I told my wife and she said, oh, that's, that's amazing. Well done. And then come to find out a few months later, I was at commentating a Sevens World Series tournament and one of the directors who works for World Rugby said, Dallin, you must be really excited for Japan. And I said, oh yeah, I, I mean, Japan's going to be amazing, but what do you mean? I, I didn't know I'm in. He goes, oh yes, you're, you're, one, of, you're one of four lead commentators uh, to broadcast for the World Feed. So that just almost knocked me over. It was, um, uh, you know, it's just, just absolute honor and, and privilege to be able to do that. And, and being the first South African and first American to be in that position as well, uh, it's just with icing on the cake and um, just such a proud moment. And, and my mom got to listen in South Africa. My wife was listening in America and friends and family. So uh, that was just a surreal uh, journey as well. Yeah, and I mean, you did pretty well for yourself at that World Cup. Um, you know, I mean, excuse me if I say his name wrong, but, uh, you know, you said uh, Kobus Reinach, he's more dangerous than climate change. So that might be one of the best lines I've ever heard. So, um. What was your favorite moment from commentating that World Cup? Uh, well, I t so so going full circle, um, when I told you I watched that rugby game at Newlands in 1995, the, the opening game, I was a 16-year-old student, and the flyer for the Springboks um, is a player called Joel Stransky. I got to commentate the World Cup with him. So we traveled around Japan with, a, and with another legend called Santiago Gomez Cora from Argentina, Sevens World Series star. For three weeks, um, uh, we got to travel around the, the southern tip of Japan together, uh, you know, share meals uh, and stories and backgrounds and, and then commentate all these different pool games, 10 games in total. So that was just, just a remarkable well, time to do that. Um, and to call all the different countries, that's really unique too, is, you know, having Namibia play or Japan, uh, you know, and, and, and countries that you wouldn't normally call was really cool because you know that everybody put so much on the line preparing for that World Cup and to be able to bring that to life was, was, was really cool. But the wine liners, I, I absolutely love him. I had a few others I, I threw in here and there. And uh, it, it, I feel like if I can bring a smile to someone's face that's listening or a laugh, then why not? Yeah, so, I mean, um, you're talking about, like, Japan. And was Japan who actually made the magic – I'm pretty sure, like, one of the teams made the run this year, was it? They did. That's absolutely, yeah. absolutely right. They were remarkable. They, they made the quarterfinals. They lost mm -hmm. to the champion, the eventual champion, South yeah. Africa. But Japan inspired a nation. They really did. They're, they're, they're where the U.S. rugby-wise would like to be in years to come. Japan had a, their professional season um, go on for about 10 or 12 years before they beat a massive side. They beat South Africa at the 2015 World Cup in the pool stages. 
And now a lot of people ask the question, when will U.S. rugby be that competitive in the 15 aside game? And with Major League Rugby going strong, I think it, you know, it will take seven or ten years, uh, but we, we, in our lifetime we'll be able to see the U.S. compete uh, with the best teams in the world uh, in 15 years. Yeah, I mean, and it's funny because I'm you know, a big soccer fan myself, and I kind of ask the same thing for the soccer side. So, um, But, I mean, Japan, I remember that they were you know, crazy that year. So um, you also own the Rugby Corner, as we mentioned before. Like, what, are you, what is the Rugby Corner and what are your goals with the Rugby Corner? Yes, the rugby corner is just to share um, particularly highlights uh, and, um, and rugby matches and, and the game to a, a, a global audience. And so it was initially was started out because I'm passionate about the sport and about, you know, um, you know, more recently commentating, but before it was about playing. And so the rugby corner is just my brand, which is now more commentating side of it, but just to try to grow the sport and not just in the U.S., but all over, which is why the, the podcast linked to it would actually be really helpful for that as well. And I think future goals, it's to continue on the Sevens World Series and, and to just be involved with the game in, in, different, in, in different capacities. I may even get more involved in coaching down the line again, because um, it's really great to be on the field as well and, and, and not just commentating the one-liners, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, um, and, you know, one last question before we kind of do some rapid fire. Um, you mentioned the Play Rugby USA and, like, how it inspired you. So what is Play Rugby USA? You know, you coach for it, and, like, how did that inspire you kind of to become not just a better, like, rugby coach, but, you know, a better man, in fact? Yes. So, again, another brilliant question, Chris. So growing up in South Africa, I saw a, um, a divide in, in, in people, um, you know, people with a different color, uh, skin color. And so that was strange as a youngster. And so that's where sport really helped bring people together. Um, and and uh, some of my best friends were from all different walks of life in South Africa because of rugby and because of the, the things we played. And so using that in Los Angeles was very unique, going to all the inner city areas, using rugby, arriving there as a white South African. A lot of times the, um, the kids were, would firstly wouldn't think I'm from Africa because they said, no, well, you're not black. I'm like, yes, they are white, white Africans as well. And, uh, and, and just to throw that rugby ball around, it got everybody's buy-in, young boys, young girls, and that is really exciting to see everybody on an equal footing. And there's no all-star player in the team. Everybody must be able to run with the ball. Everybody must be able to pull someone's flag in the non-contact version. And I think that's where some of the American sports are, um, are slightly different, that they have a star player in the team. And if you're not the star player, then you don't feel as included. But I feel like rugby is such an equal uniform game, and, and you can play in the co-ed version as well. So that, that really kind of helped help society I suppose and me as, as one of the coaches involved in it it's if you can live that every day then you can be an example to others as well and that's what I really love about it you know is to share that love and, and the community of rugby um, and, and there's always a place for everybody any shape any size any background the, the game is welcoming for everybody I mean that's you know amazing so uh you know now we have a few rapid fire questions for you just to you know get this started so uh what's the coolest fuel and or stadium you've ever played in the coolest field in the stadium. I'm gonna go with um, Hong Kong. It, it is a rem has a remarkable dome on the top of it um, with a forest in the background, and the Hong Kong stadium is always sold out. So there's forty or fifty thousand people there cheering and going wild. Uh, that, that's definitely an epic experience. Yeah, so, uh, what's your favorite song? Favorite song? A South African artist. Uh, his name is Johnny Clegg. Uh, he was a white South African artist, but his whole band were, were, were with black South Africans, um, you know, particularly during the apartheid era as well. And my favorite song um, from that one uh, is a, a song uh, it's called I Call Your Name. Uh, who's your biggest role model? Role model? Um, growing up, I would say somebody like uh, Nelson Mandela, who was just has a remarkable story of being put in prison for 27 years and coming out and just being peaceful and forgiving the people that put him there. That, mm. I can't fathom that. And so I would say Nelson Mandela for sure, um, just such an icon and, and left behind such a, such a brilliant legacy. Yeah, and uh, what's your go-to snack? Go-to snack? Oh, I love popcorn. Mm. I, and I can eat like a massive bowl of it. My wife's like, can I get some? I'm like, no, it's all mine. <laughs> it must be fun at movies then. So um, what's the coolest city you've ever played in? Coolest city? Uh, let's go for, I really enjoyed Wellington, New Zealand. It was a really cool vibe about going there and the people were so humble and so amazing. Um, but other cool city traveling wise had a great time going to Peru. Actually, that was just so unique and so amazing. I got to go to Machu Picchu. Uh, we played yeah. a tournament in Chile nearby and then caught the yeah. plane there. So I would say South America was really unique cool. and, and, 
and inspiring. I mean, those are actually two places kind of on my bucket list to go. Uh, Wellington, I you know, it's beautiful there. New Zealand's one of the most underrated countries, in my opinion. So uh, what's one country or city you want to visit that you haven't visited already? Wow, that's a good question. South America, I've been to Argentina as well. That was amazing. But I would like to explore uh, if, uh, more of more of South America. I'd like to try to go to Brazil at some point. That would be interesting. Um, and uh, and anywhere else down down that that way, you know, it's, I've only been there a couple times, so it'd be nice to explore those those that part of the world. And we've spoken of popcorn now. So, what's your favorite movie? Favorite movie of all time? Yeah. Wow. I'll go on the more serious side of things. Shawshank Redemption mm. kind of tells tells that tale, if you will. Yeah. It almost brings it back to Madiba. Uh, and then on the lighter side of it, uh, Back to the Future. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, who's your favorite player of all time? Favorite player of all time? Wow. Not named Dallin Stanford. <laughs> Sevens, yes. Yeah. Sevens, favorite player of all time watching uh, probably was Sally Sarevi for all the things he could do in the Sevens field. William Ryder, a close second during that era for stepping everybody like Park Cars. And 15 aside, I mean, there's so many brilliant players that came through. In South Africa, there was a player called Donny Chaba. He didn't get a chance to play much because of apartheid, but uh, he was my one of my favorite players of all time to watch. Mm -hmm. That's great. So uh, what's your favorite quote? Mm, favorite quote? Blessed is the man who expects nothing, for he will never be disappointed. Mm. And uh, do you have any hobbies outside of rugby and, you know, commentating now? If so, what are they? Yes, hobbies. Uh, I love going for. I love going to the beach. Uh, I love going for hikes with my wife, and um, and also enjoy a nice a nice cold beer. I love going to a brewery uh, and having a, having a cold one. <laughs> so I mean, uh, thanks, Dallin, for you know coming on the podcast. And uh, you know, California is a pretty good place for the beaches. So uh, you picked the right spot in America to go. So um, I mean, thank you, and yeah, just wish you the best of luck and the best of health with everything throughout this time. And you know, just. Hope you're, you know, staying healthy and everything. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for having me. I love what you do, my friend. I will send you a rugby ball in the mail so you have. Oh, that. thank you. Again, appreciate appreciate the support. Thank you. Well, I mean, really don't have to do that, but um, thank you, Dallin, for coming on. And uh, I'm Chris Daly from the Sports Court, and I put all your I'll put all your links in the description. So, uh, signing off, everybody. See ya.